Bomb doors open. On May the 1st, 1982, the Royal Air Force held its breath as its aging but legendary fleet of Vulcan bomber aircraft undertook one last great mission. Crew stand by one more bomb release. Five, four, three, two, one. Bomb's gone. The RAF took the first strike against the Argentinian invaders of the Falkland Islands. Its bombs delivered an unmistakable message. The British are coming and we will not be defeated. Only one aircraft could achieve this seemingly impossible mission over such great distances. The legendary Vulcan bomber. As large as a Boeing 737-200, as fast as a fighter, with an operational ceiling of 65,000 feet, her Delta shape and ultra-secret anti-radar devices made her all but invisible to enemy forces. She was unlike anything that the world had seen before, and her awesome power sent shockwaves through the Russian Politburo. <laughs> It was obvious that the Vulcan was designed for one purpose, to deliver a devastating nuclear strike against our Soviet enemies in the Cold War. This awesome weapon needed a name that would strike terror into the hearts of our opponents. Vulcan, the Roman god of fire and iron. And so was born an aeronautical legend. This is the story of one group's attempts to return this legend to the skies. The Vulcan's revolutionary shape caused much consternation in the 1950s. Although originally it was felt that the design might not give enough lift or cause drag, in fact, entirely the opposite was true. Aviation journalist Peter March recalls the first time he saw this revolutionary aircraft fly. It was September 1952, the Farnborough Air Show, and out over the Laffans Plain there was a distinctive shape in the sky, a triangle, a white triangle, something I'd never seen before. And as it came across the airfield, there was the Vulcan coming into view and displaying for a gas public. They'd never seen anything like it before. Now, Roly Falk was a distinctive test pilot who, like no other. He flew that Vulcan in August, just a week before it was displaying at the Farnborough Air Show. Farnborough 1952, and the Avro Vulcan comes off the secret list. The world's first Delta Wing bomber, it sets new standards of load carrying, faster, higher, and further than ever before. The subsequent years, he rolled it. Unimaginable for a bomber to be rolled at a public display. And he rolled it because he had the concept from the very beginning that he could fly it like a fighter. A post-World War II analysis of Allied strategic bombing affirmed the success of such tactics during the war. The new importance of nuclear weapons made it all the more imperative that the world's nuclear powers had long-range delivery capabilities. Britain's Royal Air Force issued a requirement for a new aircraft design which could be based anywhere in the world, be able to strike targets up to 1,700 miles away, and deliver a heavy bomb load from high speed and high altitude. One of the three finalists for the job was the Avro Vulcan, 
first flown on the 3rd of August 1952. The Vulcan's main distinctive physical characteristic, its large delta wing shape, was a result of the need for structural integrity and a large payload capacity. The first production model of the Vulcan, the B Mark I, flew in early 1955 and after a major wing design change entered service. In the early 1950s, former chief designer for BAE Systems, David Nadin, was a young boy. He remembers the awesome sight of the first Vulcans flying around Avro's Woodford factory. Well, I climbed up the hill of the back house and I must sort of put my age on this. I was about 11, 11 and a half, 12. And over the hill came this formation of two Vulcans lying astern, two white Vulcans, straight leading edge, with four small 707s on each corner, which is the is the model here, actually in red, so they were, they were painted red, and they were flying around the, the area of Maxfield getting the formation right, and that went down to Farnborough in, in 1957, and you see pictures of that in, in magazines and papers at the time. I can't really explain it, but really this is where my, my desire was to, be, to get involved in aviation, was to get a job at AV Row and Coal Limited, and work on the design side. Remarkably, having been inspired to get into aircraft design by the Mark I Vulcan, as a qualified designer, David Nadin would find himself working on the design of the Mark II. Structurally, the B2 is very similar to a Mark I. Nose, fuse, large, thin are the same, and the arrangement of the engines. One thing that um, distinguishes the Mark II is the bigger wingspan and also um, to um, get better aerodynamic lift out of it, they increase the, the actual uh, leading edge kink line. The Vulcan's triangular delta shape was so ahead of its time that even today her design concept is considered cutting edge. Comparison between first principle design sketches by her designer Roy Chadwick, dating to 1947, and today's B-2 stealth bomber, reveal a striking similarity. Ever since it first roared into the British national consciousness in the 1950s, the nation's love for the Vulcan has never waned. Some enthusiasts have even taken it upon themselves to return one of these great V-bombers to the skies. Bruntingthorpe Aerodrome in Leicestershire, once a base for United States bombers in the 1950s and 60s, is the new home of Vulcan XH558, a home it shares with an impressive collection of Cold War jets. This unique museum has been put together by Bruntingthorpe owner David Walton, who in the early 90s saw a chance to add a Vulcan to his collection. Initially, we, having been told that the Vulcan wasn't going to be available um, for display purposes uh, for the 93 display season. Um, we had almost dismissed the idea, um, but a few days later we received an invitation in the post to actually go and view the aircraft at Waddington. And when they learnt that we were from Bruntingthorpe, and they had obviously heard of the Lightnings being still re remaining taxable at Bruntingthorpe, they were quite enthusiastic about us uh, becoming involved and putting a bid in for the aircraft. We knew that there would be significant um, interest, both from overseas 
um, in the states and other um, other countries for the Vulcan. So we, we bid at £25,000, having uh, had a fairly considerable amount of thought put into it, on the basis that we thought we'd get the money back by increasing our gate at the air show if we, if we were successful, with more than recoup that, that expenditure. In 1997, a small team of experts, headed up by aviation enthusiast Dr. Robert Fleming, created a proposal to return Vulcan XH558 to flight. I came from an aviation background. Um, I learned to fly when I was 17. And whilst my career took me a long way away from aviation, it's always in the blood. Um, I was one of several hundred thousand people who when the Vulcan was grounded by the RAF, it was the wrong thing. Um, I'm lucky enough to have the skills and the focus uh, to uh, put together a plan to return the aircraft to flight. Uh, and now, some 10 years down the path, that's exactly what we're doing. We were informed that um, although they couldn't tell us that we'd been successful, would we please turn up at Waddington for a press, announce, a press announcement about the future of the Vulcan and please wear your best suits. And uh, it was announced that uh, we'd been the successful applicant and um, thereafter the rest is history really. It's actually a passion shared by thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, this aircraft, it's a beautiful shape, it's also awesome to see. It's one of the sights that you never forget, it's like Concorde. Um, and it's one of the reasons why a number of us are so keen to see the aircraft fly. You couldn't really say it's a cult of the Vulcan, it's more um, pride. I think pride would be, would be the right word. When we met the station commander, he took us to one side and said, if you um, get the Vulcan to Bruntingthorpe and acquire all the spares that there are available, keep it in good condition, one day, there'll be an opportunity to fly it again. He says, I'm confident that when the story of the Black Book missions come out, somebody will want to make a film of that particular um, dramatic flight, and um, it'll be a fantastic uh, film uh, to, to be made for, for public viewing. But he said, there will be an opportunity to fly the aircraft again if you keep it in good condition. So I suppose that was the motivation, really, to uh, keep systems live, keep the aircraft taxable, hang of it through the winters and um, gently, gently try to get all the uh, things in place whereby at some stage in the future there would be an opportunity to uh, return the aircraft to flight status. David Walton's decision to buy all available spares, manuals and paperwork in 1993 has enabled the aircraft's current owner, the Vulcan Operating Company, to literally rebuild her. The aeroplane is actually in a state of uh, what we call rectification. We're uh, removing components which have been sent away to their original equipment manufacturers for overhaul. Uh, on, the, on their return, we'll start to put them back onto the aeroplane and onto the systems. So at the moment, we're looking at the structure, uh, looking for any corrosion, any problems with the structure and repairing them accordingly. Then we'll put the components back on the systems and then we'll move into a function of that system. Right, going in now. This is one of the bigger tanks that we went into, number four, because it's near to the front of the wings. As you get near to the back, it gets a, a lot more restricted in height. We're looking for uh, corrosion, cracking, pulled rivets, or any signs of stress on the airframe, totally. Yeah, not too bad. French chalk seems to have kept it well. Fortunately, the engines were um, the last overhauled set of engines uh, by Rolls-Royce in 1982 and we purchased them in 1995. Now, in fact, we've done very little work to them. Um, we've inspected them uh, with a boroscope technique which has allowed us to look right down into the engines, mainly for corrosion. 
We've also removed the fuel system from the engines and they've gone off to BF Goodridge to be overhauled. Uh, the seals and diaphragms within them have aged, so as a critical to flight component, without it the engine stops, we've uh, had those overhauled. The work that we've done on the aircraft, we've followed the RAF documentation in its entirety, a thing called the Master Servicing Schedule. Now because of the age of the aircraft, we've actually, we used the word, we've done a super major. What we've done is we've looked deeper into the structure of the aircraft than was uh, previously inspected. And we've done this with modern techniques, modern uh, non-destructive testing. We've been working on the fin looking down on the inside of the fin for any signs of corrosion, signs of uh, rivets which are slightly loose, any signs of paint loss and this sort of thing. There are lots of holes around the structure, some which were there for inspection purposes, but with today's modern equipment we're able to get much, much deeper into the aircraft. It's saving an awful lot of time because to do the work that we've been doing by conventional, old-fashioned means, it would mean de-skinning one side of the fin, going in and having a look. Uh, and effectively seeing a little more than we've managed to see today. In fact, in some cases, they probably wouldn't see where we've been seeing today without very complicated mirrors and sticks and things. It's a 40-year-old design, and some of the wire on this aeroplane was post-production, so that has to have been uh, inspected wire by wire. Now, in the cockpit, we found the wire in superb condition because it wasn't exposed to any environmental hazard, rain, water, very little UV because it was in conduits. The problems we have found is outside of the cockpit area, in those areas like the undercarriage bay, where the wire, which is a rubber base wire, has been exposed to uh, the elements. So we're doing this super major. We've looked at everything. Uh, we've inspected to modern techniques. Uh, we've also used lots of generic skills and we've replaced with serviceable items from our deep storage, which fortunately we had some 600 tonnes to look at pull those components, inspect those components and then place them on aeroplane uh, as and when required. The restoration project has been a major undertaking. Dealing with 60-year-old technology has required the retraining of younger skilled individuals to civil aviation authority and RAF standards and the drafting of long retired engineers onto the project. The knowledge gap was one issue. Funding for the project is a much larger problem. We believe it, was probably, it is probably the uh, most complex aircraft restoration project that has ever been attempted. We estimated initially that uh, we'd be looking for about three million, three and a half million pounds. It has, as inevitably I think, exceeded that sum. Um, we have uh, had the wonderful support, unstinting support of very nearly, nearly 20,000 members of the friends and club members who between them have raised huge amounts of money, um, something like uh, 2.8 million pounds over the years, which is wonderful. But the key to getting this project on the way was an appeal we made or application we made for a bid to the Heritage Lottery Fund and which they accepted and 2.734 million pounds from the Heritage Lottery Fund was enough to convince us first of all that we had a project and secondly that we had convinced people that we had a national heritage asset that we were trying to preserve. That has been key to uh, everything we've done. We were approached by the group uh, three or four years ago now. Uh, they had acquired an interest in the aircraft and they wanted to restore it and they asked us if we could put a grant towards the, the restoration. Uh, we took a look at the project, it seemed very interesting, it's, it's quite unique in its way because it's one of the only aircraft that can be got back to flight and uh, eventually we decided, having looked at the risks to the aircraft and get, get, assessing its heritage merit, that it was worth putting a grant into. So we were able to give them uh, £2,700,000. It was quite a decision for us, uh, we had to assess the, the risk. Obviously we're putting the public's lottery money into the project we have to look very carefully at, that the aircraft can be restored properly and that it's going to be safe both to fly and for the public. However, despite lottery backing and countless hours of hard work, in the summer of 2006, a funding crisis threatened the entire project. I had a very, very um, unhappy task at the end of July of 2006. Uh, to go up to come up to Bruntingthorpe to give put our small but highly professional staff on one month's notice. 
to close. The project was dead because, or looking to be dead, because of uh, lack of cash flow. Um, that was a sad thing, and we, we, we had a rollout planned for 31st of August, and at that time, it looked as though that would also be the end of the project. After millions of pounds and nearly 10 years of dedicated effort, the Vulcan team were about to see their dreams turn to dust. The Vulcan operating company have battled for many years to return their beloved Vulcan bomber to the skies. However, in the summer of 2006, their dreams were dashed as a funding crisis hit. They needed to find over one million pounds in just four weeks, or the entire enterprise would collapse. Well, on that 31st of July date, we'd calculated looking forward that we would need 1.2 million pounds in order to ensure that the aircraft flew. And that was a tall order, 1.2 million in less than four weeks. That sum was raised in cash and in pledges. It was a, an absolutely remarkable achievement. Sir Jack Hayward, and I think everybody now knows this, uh, a great uh, British philanthropist and, and former RAF bomber pilot, incidentally, uh, offered us 500,000 pounds. That was matched, exceeded even, by the work of the friends and the club who between them in cash and pledges raised 700,000 pounds. We'd got our 1.2 million in less than four weeks. That was remarkable. The checks continued to come in and on the day of the rollout on the 31st of August, the checks were still coming in. I collected a check from a, a well-wisher for 60,000 pounds, 10,000 from another, and I should mention a young schoolboy who said, I've only got 92p left from my pocket money. Will that do? And we said, absolutely, and took it. So he's had a stake in this as well. With funding back on track, we could once again look forward to seeing the Vulcan bomber back in the skies. But the financial support and in particular the lottery funding given to the project wasn't just to see crowds wowed at air shows. It also had to educate Britain's younger generation about the perils of nuclear war. A remarkable irony, as the Vulcan was once one of the most deadly weapons ever devised and a deterrent against the Russian threat that nearly ended in World War III. A dark period in history that legendary author, former RAF pilot and Vulcan fan, Frederick Forsyth, remembers well. The Cuba missile crisis started with a photograph. Well, actually, a lot of photographs. They were taken by a very high-flying American U-2 spy plane over Cuba. And when they were developed, what they showed was a number of clearings in the forests, and inside the clearings what appeared to be sticks, but they were not sticks. They were rockets, and they weren't even defensive rockets. They were Soviet attack rockets, and they were aimed directly at the heart of the USA. Well, as far as President Kennedy was concerned, that was not acceptable, and he called Mr. Khrushchev over in Moscow and told him, quite literally, to remove them. Khrushchev refused. In fact, he went further. He said that a number of uh, further Soviet vessels were on their way to Cuba with further rockets and rocket parts. The American response was to put a line of US Navy warships in the sea east of Cuba between the oncoming Soviet vessels and the land. And then President Kennedy said, if you cross this line, we shall sink your ships. And Khrushchev replied, if you do, we will regard that as a declaration of war. They were literally staring at each other a few inches away, face to face. If America was attacked, the retaliation would involve British Vulcan bombers attacking Moscow. This threat led to the construction of top-secret nuclear bunkers around the UK. This is one of three uh, existing bunkers buried deep under the fields of England, uh, unbeknownst even to the agricultural workers who plough the fields far above our heads. And this is where the secret government, after a nuclear wipeout, would have taken place. 
Of the various times and occasions when danger seemed particularly high, there's one that still stands out so clearly that it raises hackles on the necks of those who remember it well. It occupied one long and very sweaty weekend in October 1962. And today it's simply referred to as the Cuba Missile Crisis. And it was the time when we probably came closest to global nuclear war. Attention, attention, this is the bomber controller for Bomblist Sierra. Scramble. For Bomblist Sierra. Scramble. Bomber controller out. One man who experienced the pressures of being on nuclear standby during the Cold War was Vulcan Bomber Air Electronics Officer Mike Pearson. On every V-4 station, four V-bombers would be uh, positioned at the end of the main runway. They would be loaded up with the type of weapons that they were tasked with dropping, and by this I mean real, live nuclear weapons or atomic weapons. What we would wear would be our air ventilated suits which were next to our skin, uh, a flying uh, overall, then G trousers, pressure trousers, a pressure jerking, and then on top of that we would wear a May West. And we wore that for 24 hours, so we slept in it, and it was very uncomfortable because all the connectors, tubes, came out to a thing down the side, uh, like a, a single connector, a chute type connector. And trying to get to sleep sometimes was very difficult. Our aim would be to get four Vulcans airborne in about a minute and 40 seconds. So from stone cold, in other words, nothing running, to actually getting airborne, we would uh, do it in about a minute and 40 seconds. This ultra rapid scramble time was of course essential. Any slower, and the retaliating Vulcan fleet would be caught up in the devastating blast when Soviet nuclear weapons struck the UK. The irony would be that even if the Vulcans successfully launched missiles against Moscow, the aircraft would have no airfields to return to, as the initial Russian attack would have wiped out the UK. By the time of the Cuban crisis, doubts were surfacing about the ability of the RAF to pierce the defences of the Soviet Union. The shooting down of Gary Powers in a U-2 spy plane in 1960 confirmed that the Soviet Union did have surface-to-air missiles capable of reaching the heights that bombers operated at. The new mantra became ultra-low-level attack. Instead of operating at over 60,000 feet, the Vulcan crews would now be operating at under 250 feet. This would not only avoid surface-to-air missiles, but allow pilots to use the new bombing technique called flick bombing, which saw the pilots do a 90-degree climb at the point of bomb release. The extra inertia created by this maneuver would literally throw the bombs at the target area. The Air Ministry realized that the surface-to-air missiles that the Russians had could get us. So, hence, we went low level. And I did one of the first low level flights on my squadron. And this consisted of flying out into the Bristol Channel, heading for the island of Lundy, coming inland. We then had to climb to get over Lundy, drop down again, cross the coast, turn left, up over Snowdonia, then drop down again, to coast out at a place called Rill. On one of our trips, we did the. Uh, we were coasting out over Rill, and we disappeared into the mist. And when we got back, my uh, wing commander operations came to me and said, "Where were you just before midday?" And I I looked at my log and I said, "Oh, we were just coasting out over Rill." Oh, he said, thank God it's you, you were reported as crashing. And the reason for that was that in those days, the Vulcans used to trail a lot of black smoke. Throughout the 1970s and early 80s, the Soviets were still very much a threat at sea. 
and a number of the remaining airworthy Vulcans carried out a vital reconnaissance role, working with the Royal Navy. Well, I served on 27 Squadron for about two years in the maritime radar reconnaissance role. I was a co-pilot. And our main job was to fly at about 20, 25,000 feet, and the radar navigator would map the ocean as looking for ships and mark them down on a grid, which he would transmit openly. Our submarines would pick up the information and they knew where our ships were and therefore the en anything left was the enemy shipping. The other role we uh, did was to go down and look at Soviet ships, the mi military ships, and take photographs of them so that we could send them back for analysis for looking for uh, any new weapon systems they had on board the ships. Despite their vital work at sea, the end was nigh for the Vulcan fleet. The RAF began the decommissioning process by disbanding number 230 operational conversion unit at Scampton on the 31st of August 1981. The remaining squadrons of Vulcans were scheduled to close at the end of June 1982. It seemed a low-key ending to a fantastic career for a groundbreaking aircraft. Some of her crews wished she could end her service in style. Then, on the 2nd of April 1982, Argentine forces under the command of Admiral Carlos Busa invaded the British territories of the Falkland Islands and South Georgia in the South Atlantic. The House meets this Saturday to respond to a situation of great gravity. We are here because for the first time for many years, British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. After several days of rising tension in our relations with Argentina, that country's armed forces attacked the Falkland Islands yesterday and established military control of the islands. It became clear within the first few days of the Argentine invasion that their recovery of the Falklands would entail a major military operation, spearheaded by the RAF. For the heavy bombing roles, there was only one aircraft which could perform the job, the Vulcan bomber. Plans to disband the Vulcan fleet were suspended and all flight crew leave revoked. Following the Argentine invasion of the Falkland Islands in April 1982, Vulcan disbandment plans were suspended and the training of flight crews in conventional bombing operations and in-flight refueling had commenced. However, as former Vulcan Air Electronics Officer Barry Macefield explains, it was training which was fraught with danger. Because the aeroplanes hadn't been used for in-flight refueling for decades, all the seals and couplings in the refueling probe, which pokes, pokes out from the front of the nose, they had all dried up and perished. And every time we tried to make contact with the Victor tanker, the fuel would escape from the front of the probe, would come over the front of the windscreen, would be squirting down the side of the aeroplane. What worried me more than anything else, being in charge of all the electrical equipment, was the fumes which possibly were in the cockpit. There were lots of arcing and sparking going around here. Are we going to end up as a big fireball? Despite the dangers, training continued until finally the Vulcan was deployed in anger on bombing raids codenamed Black Buck. Their mission required them to fly a record-breaking 7,700 miles between the nearest available base, Wide Awake Airfield on Ascension Island, and Britain's own runway in enemy-occupied Port Stanley. Then, after many hours of flying, they must destroy the runway, preventing the Argentines from using it as a base for air attacks. It was a very difficult operation. The Vulcan, as I say, was about to go out of service. As always, the Royal Air Force, but I mean all the armed services, in this case the Royal Air Force, pulled out all the stops, as did industry, incidentally. And between us all, we cobbled together um, a plan to put a bomb on the airfield and the runway at Port Stanley. 8,000 mile uh, round trip from Ascension Island. The longest strike bombing mission in history at that time. Um, and it was all done on a little bit of a wing and a prayer. Well, the thing which attracted me to the story was that somebody had had the imagination and the ambition to even 
dream it was possible. Now being asked to bomb a target uh, which was going to be the same distance from London as Hawaii is um, near the uh, Arctic Circle uh, over 4,000 miles of uh, open sea without anything more to navigate over that sea than a sextant or the same sort of thing that, that Nelson would use. The sort of shape of that story and the challenges involved uh, seemed to me kind of very similar to sort of a story like the Dam Busters. It was okay here's an impossible job go out and do it. Uh, you know, haven't really got the tools for it but don't let that bother you uh, and through a kind of combination of ingenuity, pluck, um, sort of bloody mindedness uh, they managed to sort of put together something that works. These operations have justifiably developed an almost myth-like status. The planes were flying apart, not truly fit for service. The danger of enemy attack extreme because the Vulcans had no fighter support. And because of the incredible distance involved, a remarkable piggyback refueling strategy had to be devised using the Victor tanker. The whole principle of the air-to-air -air refueling is that uh, the aircraft is make you topped up all the time to give it enough fuel to get back to an airfield. Now obviously if you're traveling three and a half thousand, four thousand miles across the Atlantic, um, then unless you've got an aircraft with a really long range, you need to refuel lots of times. So we were scheduled to refuel five times uh, on the way down to the, the South Atlantic and then we would then set off full to, to do the attack and then some hours later we would meet up with a victor off the coast of uh, Brazil and then have, fill up with enough fuel to get us back to Ascension Island. With all the odds stacked against them, the Vulcans and their brave flight crews soared into war and their finest hour. I was acutely aware that all the lights and everything were on uh, on the airfield. It felt very, very cold-blooded to go in and just drop bombs on people because at that stage you had no animosity towards them. You, you, you weren't actually feeling uh, that you were defending your own troops or anything like this. It was just a cold-blooded attack and drop a bomb. And it was then just a matter of just holding the thing really steady and hoping that we were aiming at the right point. And then the second that the last bomb had dropped, uh, just banking the aircraft and getting the hell out of there. The, the thing that ran through my mind at the time was there was no flat coming at us. I was expecting sort of lights of flak to be going past us, but also there was no orchestra playing. And again, you know, we had never done this before. I'd only ever seen it on the movies. And on the movies, when you go in for a bombing run, there's the orchestra in the background playing away. When news spread that the first Black Buck Vulcan raid had achieved its seemingly impossible mission, it sent a wave of euphoria around our armed forces and at home. What's your reaction? Just rejoice at that news and congratulate our forces and the Marines. Are we good? good night. The seventh and final Black Buck mission was flown on the 11th and 12th of June and delivered airburst bombs. Although only minor damage resulted from the Black Buck missions, the May the 1st attack had been awe-inspiring. It delivered a warning that no combat aircraft would be safe at Port Stanley. Consequently, no Argentinian fighters landed there. The Vulcans heralded Britain's unwavering response to the Argentinian aggression, a testament to the RAF's stoicism and invention in the face of adversity. Few retired aircraft retain the mystique enjoyed by the Vulcan. For many years, people have dreamed of seeing Britain's last flying Vulcan bomber in the skies again, but never dared believe the day would come. But now, that dream is fast becoming a reality, as after 10 years of tireless work and millions of pounds in funding, Vulcan XH558 is almost ready to take her rightful place in the skies once again. I think that our team here will have achieved a remarkable uh, feat in returning this aircraft to flight. It's um, the demonstrably the only project of its size and complexity in the world uh, and it'll be a real um, inspiration to others. 
that such things are possible. It's 14 years now since I last flew the aircraft um, and certain things do dim. I've, I've been fortunate because I've been able to operate several uh, Vulcans uh, during the intervening years, uh, for instance 655 down at Wellsbourne Mountford, which we operate every year for a couple of uh, episodes up and down their runway and just showing her off to the public. Uh, we're going through not only the aircraft systems, but things like what happens when things go wrong, because things are always going wrong with mechanical things. Um, so practicing uh, abandonment drills and, and the like from the airplane. Well, we've been trialling the, the new parachute, which is, uh, is a parachute which has been used by the Air Force, but it's had to be modified for our use on the Vulcan uh, to incorporate the, the use of our personal survival pack which we need to, in an emergency situation should we have to bail out of the aeroplane. And so the gentleman to come along with a couple of parachutes today and myself and Andy are trialling them. We've played inside the aeroplane and uh, seen how difficult it is to get strapped in with these things. So a modification is going to have to be made to the parachute to incorporate the uh, strapping in process. Um, we've just done a suspension trial from me hanging on this uh, forklift trolley which uh, presented his own little problems. Everything seemed out of place, but uh, the, the straps and release handles weren't exactly where I thought they were going to be. The, the thrill of being on the project is the fact that it's such an iconic aircraft. Um, I, I saw it in my service career, uh, and the, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to work on it. Um, and the fact that we were um, able to return it to flight, show it to the public, um, is a fantastic opportunity. And as a final seal of approval, XH558 has a special visitor before her final rollout, Baroness Thatcher. Well, after nine years of toil and effort by some of us, and over five for the majority, we're going to get this aeroplane back in the air. I have a body of trustees who've put every effort into helping this project along in terms particularly of fundraising um, and uh, it's been a remarkable effort by a lot of people. The, the team have been working uh, incredibly hard to uh, get it ready obviously for, for today, the taxi runs get those out of the way and uh, thankfully they were all successful, there weren't too many uh, snags to pick up, a few minor niggles but uh, nothing major and uh, on, on with today really. The team is pretty focused, as you can imagine. Um, we've uh, we had a really successful day yesterday with the, uh, the fast taxis, um, and today, just looking around me, it's it's a beautiful day. Uh, it's just right for flying, and I hope we'll be doing that slightly later. It's a tremendous achievement that the uh, the team have done. It's taken a long time. It's taken a lot of money. But I, I keep thinking back to when I was in the Air Force and flew these things, how it would take about three months to do a major service. It is an icon of British engineering, and when you think that that wonderful shape, which still looks pretty modern, doesn't it, was designed, first drawn, 60, 60 years ago. Yeah, we're just uh, checking the last things on the aircraft, but uh, otherwise things are looking really good. When I see it down the runway, my heart will go out to the crew knowing that this is the first time any of them have been in a live Vulcan in the last 10, 12 years. I'm going to feel uh, enormously proud. I mean, it's, it's almost like uh, watching your baby take its first few steps, really. It's uh, having seen the jet from uh, being in, in a basic state, stripped down, and uh, slowly building it up over, over time and bringing the systems to life, bringing the aircraft back to life. It's, uh, it's going to be amazing to finally see it go up. Feel the pride, feel the pride. Oh, it's just unbelievable. Uh, I was here in 93 on the Vulcan display team when we brought it here. And little did I know, sort of 15 years later, I'll be back here again, actually being the crew chief and getting a back up into the air again. It's just been unbelievable. Marshals 15, Marshal 15, Buntingthorpe Radio. You are clear for takeoff at your discretion.
next, a feature-length special explores the morality and military effectiveness of the mass civilian bombing in World War II, from the Blitz to the devastating Allied raids on Hamburg and Dresden.